Hello and welcome to another episode of GTN Coaches Corner where we answer all your triathlon related questions. In this week's show, we have some questions on dizziness and high heart rate in T1. And someone else has a nausea and a sea swim. And then we've got a couple of questions about people whose bike is relatively weak compared to their swim and run disciplines and they're not sure why. So let's get to answering your questions. As I said, today we answer your questions and you can answer your own questions. Use the hashtag GTN Coaches Corner, drop it in the comment section down below and we could be answering your question next week. And while you're down there, don't forget to hit that subscribe button so you don't miss all the other Coaches Corners where we answer other people's questions that may be relevant to you. So let's get to the questions. The first one, we actually have two that are basically the same question. Uh, Yoshida Nobura asks, I find that after a swim, I'm quite dizzy. It affects my run to T1 as well as the transition itself. It reduces and ends by the bike. And then Max AFC 46 says, whenever I go through transition, particularly T1, my heart rate goes through the roof. Despite it not being high while swimming or from running through T1, it seems to go crazy as soon as I start cycling. Are there any tips to help with this other than practicing the swim to bike, which is almost impossible for me to do outside of races? Right, well, there's a few things going on here and it could be a number of things. Uh, most likely it's the change from your vertical body position when you're swimming to a, uh, your horizontal position when you're swimming to a vertical position when you're biking and running through T1. Uh, what that can cause is essentially orthostatic hypertension, which is what you get when you rapidly get out of bed or off the couch and you get that head rush. Uh, essentially all the blood is rushing uh, from one position to the other and it's gonna give you a bit of a head rush and you're gonna feel a bit dizzy and it will take a little while to go away. Now, there's also the change from your arms mostly being used in the swim to your legs mostly being used as you run through T1 and your, and your bike and that's also gonna put some strain on it. Um, and as far as the dizziness goes, there's one other factor which may be water in your ears. If you're getting water in your ears and you get up, your body can't detect your body position and you're gonna get dizzy. So make sure the water's not getting in your ears. Uh, so swim in some earplugs perhaps. Uh, and if it's still there, then it's probably what I said first, which is orthostatic hypertension and that change from a horizontal position to a vertical position. Now, how you deal with this is Twofold, firstly, slow down your transitions a little bit. Yeah, there's a lot of frantic tension and you've got to get through as fast as possible. But if you rush them, you don't give your body time to make that adjustment. Uh, you are going to send your heart rate skyrocketing as Max has said happens in his and it's going to take a while to come back down and it's just not worth it in the grander scheme of your whole triathlon. You're far better taking T1 a little bit more calm, not getting that heart rate sparking so that you can start working harder on the bike sooner. Uh, one other thing you can try is kicking a little bit more towards the end of the swim. So the last 100 meters or so, really start kicking those legs. That'll help get the blood to start flowing into those legs so there's not such a shock of changing from arms to legs. Your legs already have blood flowing through, through them. Um, your heart rate doesn't spike because it's essentially trying to meet the demands of both your arms and your legs when you start running. Um, it's, it kind of more gradually makes that transition. So yeah, try those things. And as for not being able to practice outside of races, I'm not sure that's true. Yeah, I understand it's a bit difficult and tricky practicing those transitions and the change from swim to bike uh, outside of races, but you can do it. If you have an open water swim venue, you can certainly try it just park your bike next to a tree or somewhere, uh, hop out and hop on the bike as quickly as possible, practice those transitions. If you only have the ability to swim in a pool, you can still do the same thing. Maybe have someone, you can either set up a trainer on poolside if that's possible, or even have your bike outside the door uh, and make a quick transition and out there. That is a good way to practice it, to literally practice the transitions, the change from swim to bike. I hope that helps. Our next question is from Ivan Cochran, and he says, GTN Coaches Corner, when I swim in the ocean for more than 20 minutes, the constant salt from the water in my mouth makes me nauseous and I have to stop swimming. Because of this, I avoid choosing races that have the swim part in the ocean, but I'd like to not have that limitation. I imagine I'm not the only one. How do long distance Ironman swimmers deal with this? Um, my first question is, are you 100% sure it's the salt water that's doing this? Uh, it's unlikely that just salt water in your mouth is going to make you nauseous. Uh, it's... Uh, your, your body is essentially salty anyway. Now, it may be making you nauseous if you're drinking the salt water. And you may not need to necessarily drink a lot of it, but just a few drops every time you breathe 
is going to accumulate into a fair amount of salt water in your stomach and that is definitely going to make you nauseous. So the first thing I would check if I were you is your breathing timing and also your sighting to make sure you're not taking in water while you're doing that. Uh, if your breathing timing is even slightly out or you're not consistently breathing out under the water to stop water going into your mouth, you should almost certainly be swallowing a little bit of water. Um, also, you need to make sure as you finish that exhalation, you blow out not only the last bit of air before you breathe in again, you also blow out any water that's in your mouth so that when you breathe in, then you're not also taking in water. Avoiding taking water into your system. Salt water in your mouth is not gonna make you nauseous, but salt water in your stomach is gonna make you nauseous. So make sure that's not the problem. The next possibility, if that's not the problem, if your timing is right, is seasickness. Uh, and you may think, well, you don't really get seasickness when you're in the sea, that's when you're in boats on the sea and you're rocking and rolling, but you are rocking and rolling in the sea when you're swimming. Uh, and that might explain why you're only feeling in the sea, you're not feeling in fresh water, you're not feeling in the pool. Uh, even, even a slight rocking and rolling uh, in the water is gonna affect your inner ear and over 20 minutes, as you say, you start feeling nauseous. You may just be getting seasick. So practice outside of races, don't do this in your race, but try taking a seasickness tablet half an hour to an hour before you get in the sea and see if that solves the problem. If it does, seasickness is your issue uh, and you need to address that essentially with seasickness tablets before you race. Uh, the one other possibility as far as seasickness goes is that you might actually be making yourself seasick. Uh, and this is seems a bit crazy, but Essentially what people do is they get in the water and because they've got a sight and because they've got to breathe and because it's a bit rough, they tend to wave their head around a lot more than they would do in the pool. They twist it much higher when they're breathing, they bash it back down, they rock and roll and the head moves all over the place and essentially if you just roll your head around constantly for 20 minutes, you're gonna start feeling a little nauseous. So make sure that you're keeping it as smooth as possible. Practice your sighting, you can do this in the pool, just stand a water bottle at the end of the pool and every two or three strokes practice sighting in the pool and make sure you can see that bottle and over time you'll get more efficient at it. You won't have to lift your head as high, you won't move your head so extremely and it'll definitely help you to avoid that kind of seasickness. So those are the possibilities. As I say, I can't tell you exactly what it is, uh, but try those possibilities and one of those may be your issue. Okay, uh, the next question we have it's two people who actually asked pretty much the same question. First, Albert Senton says, Hi guys, for some background, this is my second season doing triathlon and I've just completed my first Olympic distance. It was so much fun slash painful. I loved it. <laughs> cool. I have a running background and my swimming is okay compared to my age group competitors. However, I lose so much time on the bike. Even with fellow athletes who swim and run are similar to me, I lose seven to nine minutes over a 40k bike. Uh, not even having lightning fast transitions helps me catch up. And then 09 Sulk 1, seems like the kind of name Elon Musk would give his kid, uh, says, just done my first 70.3 and was shocked at how relatively weak my bike was. Even though most of my training is cycling, I, need to, I know I need to be more specific in my bike training, more intervals and more focus sessions rather than long, steady, hard rides. Uh, of course, upgrading my gear will also help, but I wonder if there's something obvious I'm missing. I was literally in the bottom quarter of the field on the bike and the top third for both the swim and the run. What am I doing wrong? Help. Okay, well, building bike strength is a bit of a puzzle uh, because the bike requires a whole bunch of different things and you can't actually train all of them at the same time. Essentially, you need to build your aerobic conditioning, of course, because it is aerobic, uh, which means longer time in the saddle, higher cadence, lower intensities. Uh, you also need to build your strength and endurance, so you need to be able to push power for a consistent amount of time, which means if it's at lower cadence, uh, and then you need to work on your neuromuscular recruitment, which means very low cadence and very high cadence to make sure you're using your muscles as effectively as possible. And on top of all of that, you need to build your VO2 max, which is your threshold work, your really high intensity stuff. And you've got to fit all of those into a program that also has swimming and running. And if you're not doing some of those, you may find that that's where your weakness lies. And the best way to do this is to practice this in training, to have a program that addresses all of those things and you'll very soon be able to see which one of them is your weaker discipline and you can focus a bit more on improving that particular part of your cycle training. It may be that you're just riding with slightly too high cadence and if you lower it, you're great, or the opposite perhaps. And maybe your gearing choice, you it's easy to 
immediately put your bike into an easy gear as soon as it gets a little bit hard because you have that option. Whereas on the run, you kind of just have to push through the harder bits and same with the swim. Uh, so make sure you're choosing the right gear to maintain that power. Those kind of things you can only really practice on the bike. I would say that your best bet is to get a decent program that addresses all of the specific strengths that you need on the bike and then stick to it for a while. And pretty soon you'll be able to see where your weakness are, is. The difficulty of course with this is that it has to be balanced with your swim and your running as a triathlete. You don't want to neglect those ones because you're working so hard on your bike to improve it because then you'll just see you're losing gains. But I would say if I had an athlete like this and we were trying to figure out where their issue was on the bike, it may be worth taking a few weeks, a month or so, where you really back off on the swimming and the running and you really focus on the cycling to isolate where those issues are, to isolate whether you can't climb well, whether you can't get the power out, whether you just don't have the aerobic fitness in your legs, whatever it might be, and then you can start addressing that and build that into your program as you bring back the swimming and the running. It is a puzzle, triathlon training is a puzzle, and figuring out where you can get the most gains, and for both of these guys, it seems like their biggest gains are going to, become, are going to come from improving their bike. If they improve their bike and can get their run and swim back to where they currently are, they're going to be way faster than they were. So yeah, build that puzzle and figure out where your weakness is and then work on your weakness, because that's where you can get the most gains in your overall performance. We hope these questions have helped someone out there and helped these guys who actually asked them. Remember, you can ask your own questions down below if you have something specific that you're struggling with on your triathlon. And we could be answering in next week's Coach's Corner. So, see you next week.